Thank you very much, Sen, and thank you for the invitation to talk at this workshop. I've enjoyed the All Things EFT series, and it's really been a learning experience to see how much work has been done in this field. So as the rules of uh, the All EFT series, I have to tell you which effective field theory I'm talking about. So I am talking about the SMEF with the major, with the big assumption that there's no new physics at a scale, uh, at the energy scale much lower than lambda. So at the weak scale, we have the standard model SU3, SU2, U1 symmetry, and standard model particles only. So there's no light Higgs boson, no new lepto quarks, nothing at the weak scale. So in this scenario, all new physics is described by this effective field theory Lagrangian, which is an expansion in powers of one over lambda. So lambda is assumed big. I've got the dimension five, dimension six, dimension seven, dimension eight terms, and so forth and so on. And these Lagrangians are operators and coefficients. So all of the new physics is contained within these coefficient functions. So if I have a model, I can calculate these coefficients functions in some high energy limit. And these operators, oh, form a complete basis. And of course, we all know that this basis is not unique. I will be talking here about the Warsaw basis for these operators. I will not be talking about L5 and L7 because they're lepton number violating. So that would be a different talk. So the big assumption here is that there are no new light fields and that the Higgs is in an SU2 doublet. So let me start with the disclaimer. SMEFT has become the tool of choice for precision physics searches for new non-resonant physics effects at the LHC. And I think the theory community should be very proud and pleased that now we've expanded our study of SMEFT. We've convinced the experimental community that when they look for Higgs physics, for example, the kappa framework is no longer sufficient. And we've got uh, the LHC community busy to try to do SMEF fits. So now when you do SMEF fits, there are a lot of uh, decisions you have to make. So what I'm going to talk about here are the issues that arise when you're trying to get new physics from SMEF studies. So I, I have more questions than conclusions. I, I hope to present some of the big issues that you have to address in doing these experimental studies, but I'm not gonna tell you the answers. I don't know the answers. So there've been many beautiful theory talks in this all things EFT series, but this is not one of them. This is a, a talk focused on the big picture questions that we need to address. So my plan is to start with the LEP and SLD studies and then touch on the DIE boson studies at the LHC. We've already heard a number of relevant talks at the F21 workshop on these uh, issues. Um, and then I'm going to conclude by discussing the LAC EFT working group activities. And I wanna emphasize that this is my personal view of these studies. This is not an official report from this working group. I'm gonna tell you what is happening. And I hope to encourage many of you to get involved in the activities of this EFT working group. But the EFT working group is only at the initial stages at this point. There is lots of room for everyone to contribute and make an important uh, contribution to how these studies go. So what are the advantages of the SMEFT approach? Well, it's a quantum field theory where the calculations are done order by order in one over lambda. So I can compute cross sections without knowing the high scale physics. And because it's a quantum field theory, it's systematically improvable. And today I'm gonna to talk about some higher order QCD and electroweak corrections to SMEF predictions. So at this level, the SMEF calculations are model independent. So the measurements are interpreted in terms of SMEF coefficients, and then you can compare very different classes of measurements. And this sounds very good, but how does it work in practice? And even more important, is this really model independent when we get down to making limits on SMEF coefficients? So let's start by counting parameters. I'm gonna use the Warsaw basis and ignore flavor, which is a huge assumption, but that's what I'm gonna to do to start with. So I'm gonna begin by considering the interference of standard model and dimension six operators. So this means the new physics contributions are linear in the Wilson coefficients. And this already tells you that I've neglected a number of things. For example, dipole top type operators, so OUW, which would give a dipole interaction between up quarks and the W, for example. So if I have QQ bar 
going to W going to say E nu or something. This would uh, get a contribution proportional to the square of OUW in the standard model because the interference with the standard model is proportional to the mass of the fermions. So this type of operator is neglected in the approach I'm using. And also the standard model resonant terms are typically small, are typically dominate over the four fermion interactions by powers of the resonance. So if I'm talking about uh, LEP or Higgs pole data, the resonant terms like this up here would dominate over the four fermion interactions. And of course, if I start including the one over lambda to the fourth contributions, the number of parameters increases exponentially. So it's interesting just to go back to this table, which was made four years ago, where they counted the number of operators in different scenarios. So of course, if you start with the most general Lagrangian, you've got 2,499 operators, and nobody's going to do a fit to that. If you assume minimal flavor violation, you're down to 108 operators. And if you assume a U3 to the fifth symmetry, you're down to about 70 operators. If you further look at things that are not suppressed by resonant powers, you get 24 here, 30, 46. So it's starting to be the number of operators you can do a fit to. But of course, we know the top fork is different from the up fork. So neglecting flavor and assuming the U3 to the fifth symmetry is not a great assumption. So let me start with the electroweak precision observables. There's a tension with the standard model, which suggests that maybe NW should be an observable in the fit. So if we look at MT versus MW, the measured values are the green here, up and down. The fit uh, without the Higgs mass is the gray blob, and the fit without, with the Higgs mass is the blue blob. And you can see there's a little bit of tension in the W mass compared with the direct search experiments. And this fit, of course, assumes the standard model. It assumes that there's nothing new going on. So there's a little bit of room going on here, but we can expect to get more data on the W mass from CMS and ATLAS going forward, and maybe this will change a little bit. We can also try to extract the Higgs mass from the indirect measurements. So here's the top quark mass and the Higgs mass. So the green line here is the fit from the width of the Z. The blue uh, straight lines here are from Z pole asymmetries, and the blue dash lines here are from the W fit. So here's the fit to MH and MT from the indirect fits, the red blob. And you can see that there's a consistent picture from the precision measurements, but there's still room for new physics. Okay, so the first thing we have to decide when we're doing a SMEF fit are what are the input parameters? I'm going to begin by talking about the electroweak corrections. So the input parameters are very important. And in the electroweak sector, it's typically described by three input parameters along with the fermion masses. So you can take G mu MW MZ, you can take G mu alpha MZ, you can take alpha MZ MW. And you can say it doesn't matter which set of parameters you choose. But of course, you have to be consistent in uh, comparing apples and apples. So your electroweak precision all has to have the same set of input parameters. And if I'm going to compare it with LHC data, that has to have the same set of input parameters so that we can compare things. So the standard model relationships are altered in this meth to the relationships with the Lagrangian parameters, G bar and G bar prime. And this is, of course, well defined. So for example, if I use the GMU MWMZ scheme, the relationship between the Lagrangian parameters and the physical WZ and G Fermi just have corrections due to these uh, coefficients in uh, the Warsaw basis. So CHWB is essentially S and CHD is the shift in the kinetic energies. So there's a shift here and here's GMU and it's pulling around some leptonic uh, operators. So the relationship between the VEV and G Fermi gets a correction here from these leptonic operators. So if I have a scheme that uses G mu as an input, I'm going to carry around a dependence on these leptonic operators. So of course, there are also new contributions to these relationships when I include the next order in the expansion, the V to the fourth over lambda to the fourth terms. And it's a small number of dimension eight operators. And if it's all well-defined. So the W mass gets a contribution from some dimension eight operators and the Z mass relationships get more contributions from dimension eight operators. 
So this is well-defined and one can do this. So when I'm thinking about what my input parameters are, what are the considerations? Well, I want the extraction of the input parameters from the data to be well-measured quantities. And I want this to be insensitive to SMEF defects. So this tells me that on-shell masses from kinematic features are particularly good. For example, the top port mass from a kinematic that threshold or the Z or the W from kinematic effects. So these are relatively insensitive to new physics. So most of the higher order electroweak calculations use alpha, G, mu, and MC. So if I use alpha, G, mu, and MC, the issue is that the relationship between G mu and alpha and MC gets corrections from this parameter delta R, and it's got these uh, leptonic operators, which I mentioned here. But the dependence on the W mass is encoded here. It's MW over MZ. So typically, the dependence on MW is nonlinear for LHC observables. So a lot of the LHC studies use G mu, MZ, and MW. So we'd like to have a consistent choice between this. And of course, again, it's well-defined. One can go back and forth, but you have to be careful to do this. So I'm going to begin by talking about W and Z pole observables. The W and Z pole observables, you can fit to 14 data points here using G mu, MZ, and alpha Z inputs. So I fit to MW, the width of the W, the width of the Z, and the typical, the LEP SLD observables here. And the tree level expressions depend on uh, eight, eight combinations, 10 operators here, and eight combinations of these operators. So here are the 10 operators. Um, here are the eight combinations here. And so there are two blind directions in the fit to the left observables at tree level. And this is, of course, well known. So if I try to parameterize the, the non standard model couplings in the effective coupling language, I've affected Z, W, fermion couplings. So I can have non-standard couplings of the Z to the left-handed up quarks, non-standard couplings to the right hand to the left-handed down quarks, to the right-handed up quarks, and so forth and so on. And it's straightforward to express these effective couplings in terms of the coefficient of the Warsaw bases. So these fits have seven new parameters plus MW, as I said. The right-handed W couplings do not interfere with the standard model. And I'm going to do a fit that is linear in the EFT coefficients. So to, to begin, one wants to use the most precise standard model theory. So these are the theory results from the PDG. And the point I wanna emphasize here is the experimental uncertainties are given here and the theory uncertainties are given here. And at this point in time, the theory uncertainties are much smaller than the experimental uncertainties. But going forward to future E plus E minus machines, you, you expect that these experimental numbers will become much smaller. So it's important to also include the theory errors. And we know the parametric dependence on MH and MT, which is included in uh, the fits I'm going to show you. So one can calculate the NLO corrections in the SMEF. One can compute these NLO corrections to order V squared over lambda squared linear in the EFT coefficients. So that since the SMEF is a new theory, one can calculate this consistently to one loop QCD and one loop electroweak. So you get the standard model corrections for free and as a check of your SMEF calculations. And the Feynman rules are automated in various pieces of code here. And QCD in SMEF is now a solved problem. It's automated in SMEF at NLO and I can get the QCD results for a SMEF observable. However, the electroweak SMEF corrections are still done on an individual basis at present. The SMEF coefficients are normalized in MS bar. And again, this is a solved problem. So we can put this all together to do these NLO electroweak corrections. So one of the complications for doing the NLO electroweak corrections is that the relationship between G mu and uh, the radiative corrections here, this delta R, gets these SMEF pieces and they have both logarithmic and finite contributions, which are generically at the same size. So this is the relationship again between G mu and the VES. So at one loop, you get a dependence on lots of coefficients that don't occur at tree level. So in the electroweak fit, you, there are 10 combinations of operators involving 32 operators in the electroweak fit. So you can compute each observable to NLO in the SMEF. So the way this fit is done, 
is fitting to the experimental value of W mass with a standard model prediction in delta MW. So all the SMEF defects are here. And so what we've done is use, quote, the best standard model prediction that I showed in that uh, table. One could, in principle, use the NLO result, which would be consistent to NLO. And numerically, it makes a little bit of difference with which you use. So as you do the fit, say, to MW, I've just shown what happens here. The coefficients that occur at tree level get a little shift, 30 to 36 here, 15 to 17, when you go to NLO. And then you generate a dependence on all these new coefficients here. And this is the alpha G mu and MZ scheme. So you can calculate your chi-squared just as you always do. And this chi-squared is actually given in this archive paper. You can download it and do your fit as you like. So you see that uh, the coefficients in the chi-squared change, some of them by uh, 5 to 10 percent. And there are uh, 22 more terms here. So once you go to NLO in these fits, you have a dependence on all of these new coefficients. So now you might say, well, does this matter? And the answer is yes. So if you do the single parameter fits from lowest order to NLO, you can get sort of 30%-ish effects here when you look at the various coefficients. So for example, here you go 43, 36. That's a kind of uh, change you get at NLO. So marginalizing over the coefficients, it's similar. You get uh, 10, 20, 30%, depending on the fit here. This is particularly big, this C phi D here, and that shows the uh, limits of this kind of fit because we neglected flavor effects and the fit to this particular coefficient gets contributions from top loops and that's why it's so big here. So you see that these NLO fits can be important. Here is a fit to what uh, C phi WB and C phi D. These are the parameters which correspond to the S and T parameter and the fit to uh, these parameters, the NLO corrections are minimal. So the question is what to do with these? And I think the only possible answer is that they need to be included in a complete NLO global fit. But of course, we don't have a complete set of electroweak corrections to all the observables that we're going to fit to. So you can ask, well, does this fit make sense doing the linear fit, linear versus quadratic? So this is a fit uh, from uh, Concha and her collaborators doing a quadratic fit and a linear fit. And this is a fit to the observables that are primarily uh, determined by the electric weak precision observables. And the fit is comparable between the linear and the quadratic fit. So for these particular observables, the linear fit and the quadratic fit with the dimension six operators does not change things too much. And of course, this is partially because the precision Electroweak precision observable expansion is E squared over lambda squared and E is MZ. But these are tree level fits in this plot. So if I wanted to go to NLO in the electroweak theory, I would have to include uh, double insertions. And there's also been some work recently on the dimension eight uh, effects in the electroweak precision fits, which show that they can be relevant. So even though the electroweak precision observables have been around for a while, the story isn't over. We still need to quantify the effect of these higher order corrections in a consistent uh, v, v to the fourth over lambda to the fourth uh, calculation. So what does this mean for future colliders? So what I've shown here are some results of Pierre Paolo, where he looked at the precision at, at LEP, ILC, and the FCC to quantify the precision on the, expected on these coefficients, including lowest order and NLO. And you can see the FCC EE is down here with quite precise results, okay? So you can see the uh, difference between the lowest order and the NLO in some of these coefficients. You can see the ILC here ver versus left, the improvement uh, in these, these uh, extractions of the coefficients. And you can also see, he's done a very interesting thing here, showing the effects of the NLO versus the lowest order coefficients at these different machines. So this is like the delta NLO. So it's plotting these differences here. So this is LEP, FCC, and ILC. And you can see the effect of the NLO uh, corrections at the ILC is quite different 
from uh, left at CC. And that's, of course, since the ILC has polariz will have polarization, you measure different combinations of operators. So for some of these operators, the effect of these NLO corrections is really critical for extracting uh, coefficients at future E plus E minus colliders. So finally, before I leave the electroweak uh, stage, I want to talk about this question of uh, the input parameters, which I've I've emphasized. So there's a test case that I've shown here is the Higgs to gamma gamma here, just the uh, decay width. So what these plots show is the mu gamma gamma as a function of the coefficient functions for some of the coefficients. And it shows two schemes. So the solid lines are the G mu, MW, MZ scheme, and the dotted are essentially the alpha G mu and MZ scheme. And for these coefficients here, say CHWB, CHV, and so forth, you can see the dependence on the scheme appears to be really minimal. But now if I look at a different set of coefficients, the leptonic coefficients, CLL, C phi L3, look at say the solid line and the dotted line. And it appears that the dependence on the input scheme is quite large. However, in some sense, this is an artifact that I've plotted ridiculously large values of the coefficients. If you look at a current fit to these uh, operators, these coefficient functions, I should really slice in the middle. So depending on how precisely I can measure these coefficients, the scheme is more or less uh, important. So a better way to make this plot would be to blow it up around uh, the origin here and see that there's a very small dependence. OK. So the issues are fairly straightforward for E plus E minus data, but of course they get much more complicated for PP data. So the, the true power of the SMEF, of course, is the connection of the data from different processes, from Higgs, TOP, precision observables, dye bosons. And other people have made uh, plots like this, which are much more beautiful, and I should have stolen one of them. But the point is clear, is that we want to connect the data from all these different uh, processes. So let me start with dye boson production. It's, of course, an old, old story. It goes way back to Hagawara, Peche, Zeppenfeld, and Casa in 1987, where they noticed if I changed the, the interactions of the Z and the Ws, I would get effects which grow with energy, and that these effects are exactly canceled in the standard model. So these cancellations in the standard model keep the amplitudes from growing at high energy, so once I'm in the SMEFT and I have changed these uh, interactions, of course, I spoil this cancellation. And this is why I can get strong effects. So just as with the E plus E minus state of the interactions with the Z, it's straightforward to parameterize the anomalous couplings of the gauge bosons in terms of the G1, V, G at kappa V and lambda V. And these, of course, can be related to the coefficients in the Warsaw basis. And the dictionary occurs in many places. So you can do your counting, and you've got a sensitivity to seven combinations of Wilson coefficients. So there, there have been a lot of fits to uh, these operators. And I want to emphasize that just as in the electroweak precision data, the NLO corrections matter. So when I do the fits to these coefficient functions, the QCD effects matter. So the K factors are not the same as in the standard model. And I point you to the talks by Eleni and Ken at the KITP Precision 21 workshop. Um, I'll put the link here later. It wasn't there when I searched for it. But so they surveyed the effect of QCD NLO results and showed that QCD was really important. It, in top quark physics was the example they showed. So let me show you an example here for, from WZ physics. So this is the K factor in the cosine of an angle that's typically measured in WZ production for high PT of the Z. So going out to large momentum transfer. So here's the standard model K factor, which is the black line here. The blue is for a set of EFT coefficients allowed by LEP data, which change the fermion interactions. And, oh, that's the red, is changing the fermion interactions. And the blue is changing the gauge boson interactions. So you can see that the K factor is simply not the same as in the standard model. So if I want to do fits 
to uh, PP data, I need to include QCD. And of course, it's now automated uh, in the QCD tools that have been developed. So let me just show you a few fits to bring home this uh, point that QCD changes your fits. So these are fits to WW and WZ data. So this is an anomalous coupling of the left-handed Z to the up fork with one of the uh, anomalous couplings of the three gauge bosons. And again, these are two anomalous couplings of the gauge boson interactions. The dashed here is the, blue, is the lowest order and the blue is a fit with QCD. So including QCD changes your fit. So these particular fits include uh, the one over lambda to the fourth interactions of the dimension six operators. So this brings us to the really important question of when is the EFT valid? And so we started with this expansion of Lagrangian, the dimension six operators, one over lambda squared, the dimension eight operators, one over lambda to the fourth. So if I include only these dimension six operators and square, the left fits that I showed were A standard model squared, A standard model A6 over lambda squared. And in the left case, I showed that uh, this term was quite small for the fits that I did. But the problem is that if I drop these terms to get a, a fit that's linear in the coefficient functions, and I've also dropped these terms here. So these terms in principle could be the same size. I have no idea what the coefficients are, the relative size, but it's an issue when I include the A to the A6 squared terms and not these terms. So let me just demonstrate this. This is one of my favorite plots that I always show in my talk because it, it makes the issue 100% clear. So what this plot is, is W pair production as a function of the PT of the W. And the black line is the standard model uh, prediction. And the blue line includes uh, QCD and NLO electroweak corrections. I note that this goes way out to 3 TeV. So a fit done to including the one over lambda to the fourth terms and the dimension six operators are these two curves up here, the green and the red, and they just have different assumptions for the anomalous couplings. I just randomly pick some that are allowed by lab. And you can see that as you go out high in uh, PT, all of the oomph of the fit is coming from these dimension, these one over lambda to the fourth terms out here. So if I do the linear expansion, I've got this blue dash curve here. And since I'm not calculating an amp squared, at some point it goes negative. So out here, the fit is no longer valid. So you can have whatever opinion you want about what to do about this, but you've got to do something. So a lot of the fits, they just throw out the negative cross sections. Another approach, which has been emphasized in this paper, is that you can deal with this issue by putting a cut on the maximum energy where the SMEF is assumed to be valid. So I could put a cut down here at PT of, I don't know, 500 or something, and the cross section would be completely positive and do the fit that way. So this is an issue that we can study numerically. We don't have to uh, make approximations. We can study this and, and draw conclusions. So the first thing you can do is look at the relative size of these interference terms, the one over lambda squared terms and the one over lambda to the fourth terms. So these are the interference terms over here, this piece, and these are the quadratic terms over here. So as you go way out in, in uh, this is MTWZ for WZ. So if I go out here, you can see the quadratic terms and the interference terms, and the quadratic terms are much larger. Note that the scale is very different here. This goes to one and this goes to 0.15. So if I neglect the quadratic terms and I start going down to smaller bins, putting a cut here, you can see that the relative size between these interference terms and the quadratic terms changes if I have a cut on the maximum and TWZ. So I can quantify this in various ways and try to develop validity criteria. So one way- uh, Ellie, can I ask a question? Uh, yeah, I don't know, sure. Uh, just to, in your plot where the thing goes negative, what was the lambda that was used in that plot? Oh, these all have a TV. Sorry, could you say that again? These all have a TV. Oh, thank you. Yeah. So, I mean, it's in some sense, it's irrelevant because it's just the coefficient over lambda. Yeah. So, yeah, absolutely, Michael, I can play with this. Sorry, I forgot to write this. All of my plots are TV. 
you can rescale as you like. Okay, so so for example, yeah, in these you can see CW over lambda squared is 0.15 TV to the minus two. So, so if I put a cut here, I can try to quantify this effect versus this effect here. And I can try to de develop validity criteria. Okay, so the first thing you can do is say, well, does this matter? I can try to do blind fits to these linearized rates. So th this fit just drops all coefficients where the cross section is negative. So th th this is a fit to WW plus WC, linearized. So here, this is one of the anomalous three gauge boson couplings, and this is another one of those. So this fit, here's a lowest order linear fit. Okay, the dotted lines here. When I do it at NLO, it shifts the curve a lot, which is consistent with what I said that NLO really matters in these fits. And when I do the one over lambda to the fourth, I get this pink thing here. So I get very different results depending on how I do this. And what this, uh, these shaded regions show is that the blue region has negative cross sections at NLO and the gray region has negative cross sections at lowest order, okay? So over here, this fit, you can see here, this is the effect of just throwing out the terms where, where the cross section goes negative. Okay, so I guess you get the point that whatever I do here is gonna make a huge difference on what I think the fit is. Okay, so I can continue to try to see how to develop these validity constraints. I can look at successively throwing out high scales here. So maybe all of this effect is coming from the last spin and I can try to implement a cut on the maximum energy. So this is WZ production at lowest order is the dash and the blue is the NLO, and this is a limit on delta kappa Z and delta G1C as a function of the cut on MWC. So you can see if I throw out the last spin and then I go down to say 400, depending on wh what cut I make on the maximum energy, I'm gonna get a different limit on these kappas. So if I do my fit, assuming there's a maximum energy cut, the fit is dependent and it's very important to say, what the limit is here. So if I extract a limit on delta kappa Z by throwing out all points above MTWZ, in order to compare this with other processes, I have to have a similar kind of cut. So this is something I think we need to work out in the theory community, how to do this, if this is the way we're going to do our fits. So you can see that the assumptions are creeping into my fits. It's no longer this beautiful theory that we've talked about in many of these, uh, these talks in this series, but now it's getting kind of messy and ugly. So this is a fit with my collaborators, and it's a fit to just four pieces of data, WW, WZ, WH, and ZH. The linear fit, the one over lambda squared piece, merely throws out the points with negative cross sections. And the fit assumes the standard model efficiencies in each bin, which might not be true. And it ignores flavor, which is definitely a bad assumption. So what you can see here is the black are the lowest order fits. So that's this guy and this guy. And the blue are the NLO fits. So that's this guy and this guy. And you can see the tremendous difference between doing the fit linearly and doing the fit quadratically, throwing out pieces. So if you're gonna do the fit linearly, you're gonna get much weaker uh, fits than you would do quadratically. So I think plots like this are useful to theorists to try to figure out what's going on and make their assumptions from this kind of fit. So I just wanna point out that earlier in this uh, HEFT 2021 talk, Madigan gave a much more sophisticated re review of the fits. And uh, what she showed is when you do these fits and you include flavor, it actually makes it. A pretty big difference. So I showed that including NLO QCD makes a big difference. Um, also including flavor makes a big difference. We don't have the electroweak corrections to include those in the LHC fits. So I think we still have some work to do here. So all of this is including dimension six operators, but of course we could think about dimension eight operators. So the big advance and I didn't put the references, I apologize, I'll add that. We now have a catalog of the dimension eight operators. They're all written down, we know what they are. 
So we can look up the dimension eight operators and calculate a process, our favorite process at lowest order, including these dimension eight operators. So for example, for the WH process, which we just heard about in the last talk, so that was a great buildup for this, the WH process, there are 16 different uh, form factors that can come in here when I include the dimension eight operators. So suppose I go to the high energy limit. So I look at the uh, leading piece in S. And what Anglaire showed in his last talk is that the contribution from CHQ3 is the one that grows with S. So this is the leading uh, piece in the energy dependence, which grows with S from the dimension six operators. So this particular operator is limited quite precisely from uh, the LEP and SLD data. So what uh, these people did in this fit said, well, since it's limited by the LEP data, we'll just neglect this operator. So if I neglect the dimension six operate contributions from CHQ3, then the dimension six squared pieces go like B to the fourth over lambda to the fourth, whereas the interference of the dimension eight with the standard model grow with S. So this is the kind of scenario that you might be worried about where there's a different counting between the dimension six squared and the interference of the dimension eight with the standard model. So they did a fit trying to quantify what the size of the dimension eight operators might be. So they looked at the high energy tail of one of the operators. Okay, and then they, said, well, can I pull out the dimension eight pieces? So they did a fit to CHW, one of the operators. And if they didn't include the dimension eight operators, they got this blue line here. And then they made some assumptions about the dimension eight operators. One of them was that they threw out uh, things where the dimension eight effect would be bigger, the dimension eight squared effect would be bigger than the dimension six squared effect. And you can make various assumptions, but you can see that it's possible to get you know, 20, 30% effects from this. So this is something that we still need to uh, understand in the theory community. And the other very, very interesting thing about this study they did is that they found that it was possible to have very large cancellations depending on the sign, S-I-G-N, of these dimension eight operators. So I think we don't really understand what to do with the dimension eight operators yet, because we don't have too many models where we understand the size of these operators. Okay, so this is the bottom line of my message is that there's a lot of uh, sausage making to go from this beautiful picture with a Lagrangian to fits like this where I extract coefficient functions. And I also wanted to make the point here is that we now have the tools to evaluate these numerical effects pragmatically. We can study what the size of the interference effects with the standard model. We can study the size of the dimension uh, six squared pieces. We can put in onslaughts for the dimension eight pieces and study them. So we have a lot of tools and I think we can do a better job of understanding the numerical effect of these various decisions. So that gets me to the LAC EFT working group. This is chartered under the LPCC at CERN and it's a working group that's gathering members of the LAC experiments and the theory community to provide a framework for the interpretation of LHC data in the context of effective field theories. And this is going to study the physics requirements needed to facilitate an interpretation with the in available measurements performed in a wide range of different processes, including Higgs bosons, top quarks, and electroweak bosons. So this is interesting in that it brings together the different LHC communities, the Higgs community, the top quark community, the diboson community to try to do common fits. And so for the LHC, this is a new thing to do the fits within these different working groups. And so it's up to the theorists to try to make sense of these questions that I've posed in the beginning part of this talk before the fits are done. Because when the fits are done, the FITS will make choices as to input parameters, as to quadratic versus linear FITS. So these choices will be made. So it's important for us to sort of understand the numerical effects. So this has been a rather active working group so far. It's had six topical workshops. It's had workshops on the formalism, which basis and which inputs. So I think it's fair to say that probably everybody's gonna use the Warsaw basis. The question of the inputs is now being discussed and 
will be presented at a workshop in May, and I suspect that this will not be controversial, which inputs to use. Predictions and tools, there are a lot of tools out there, some of which we hear about at the HEF 21 workshop, and one would like to validate that they're uh, consistent with each other. Which measurements and observables are most effective for teasing out these EFT effects? They're doing these global fits and the systematic. Uh, there's theory, benchmark scenarios from the UV models. Once I do these fits, what do they tell us about the UV? How do I connect consistently between the fits and some model I might have at some very high scale? And just this week, we had a very beautiful workshop on the heavy flavor inputs to the EFT fits. And po it's pointed out that this uh, flavor independence assumption is really not a great assumption. So this is my last slide. Where is this going? There's a general meeting of the EFT working group, May 3rd. Um, the hope is that this EFT working group will generate uh, a proof of principle combination exercise fit with CMS and ATLAS and using some selection of top pigs and die boson data. So of course, this proof of principle combination is going to have to pick which kinds of data and which operators and how to do the fits in order to make it sensible. So this is going to be a proof of principle, not the uh, global theory fit that we might all hope will come in the future. So this working group is in the process of writing drafts of short notes detailing the issues that arise in these fits. So everyone here is welcome. I, I'm recruiting. I hope that people will contribute to this effort and to this working group to make it sensible because it's clear that there are many theory issues that need to be resolved before you get these practical fits. I just listed some of them here, but there are a lot of theory issues. And when you do a fit, you have to make a choice and hopefully we can uh, make sensible choices. So that's the end of my talk. Thank you.